Passions of a surrealist. We join George Melly on a curious journey. The marvelous is always beautiful. Anything marvelous is beautiful. In fact, only the marvelous is beautiful. Today, I'm going to make a journey. I'm going to walk from where I live in North London to see the great exhibition of Dada and Surrealist art at the Hayward Gallery. But I'm not going to see just an exhibition. I'm also going to meet my youth because it was as a youth that I fell in love with Surrealism and joined the Surrealists in England. I was in the Navy at the time. I was about 18, 19 years old. And I discovered a book by Herbert Reed called Surrealism. And I read it, and I looked at the images in it, and I suddenly realized that here was a key to a world I'd always suspected existed, but which I didn't know how to get into. Looking at this naval uniform by my side and thinking of myself inside it then, a young, rather silly, very hysterical young man, I can remember at the same time the absolute joy of opening my eyes in the morning and thinking, today I live the surrealist life, today I see through surrealist eyes. Surrealism is the spirit of the dream coupled with reality. It's reality as it might be. It's reality infused with poetry. It's not mystical. It relies only on what is there, but it combines these two to produce a world totally free. I must get up now and shave and wash and bathe and put on clothes and do all those other things that people do every morning and which they find perfectly normal. The Surrealists never believed in looking bohemian because they realized that people expected bohemian artists to behave madly. And so they chose to look like everybody else. And when they did, therefore, attack the bourgeoisie through surprise, scandal, or whatever means they chose, it was all the more shock to those they attacked that those who were attacking them looked exactly like themselves. Messens, for instance, was absolutely meticulous about his appearance and in the bathroom, even to the point of obsession. For instance, he shaved no less than three times using a fantastically elaborate mathematical system to select a Gillette razor blade from a huge pile he kept on the glass shelf in front of his glass. Magritte also, of course, was an extremely neat, well-shaven person and indeed painted, dressed like a businessman in an office rather than as an artist. He never used a smock, for instance, and he always wore a tie. He too painted a picture of objects used in his toiletry, blown up to an enormous size in a small room, the walls of which are made of clouds. All the people in that little train, which rattles along between Richmond and Broad Street, have already shaved. They're on their way to work. At least I presume most of them have shaved, except for those, of course, with beards. The thing that uh, Marcel Duchamp, the Dadaist, did was to add a moustache to the Mona Lisa. And then about 40 years later, he reproduced the Mona Lisa without the moustache, called the Mona Lisa Shaved. 
And again, in Dali and Bunuel's film, The Andalusian Dog, the opening shot shows somebody sharpening a razor on a balcony. A moon with the cloud passing in front of it and the razor passing through the eyeball of the girl. Horrifying image that. I remember once seeing it at a film society and a man said, I can't watch this sort of thing. I play Raga. My wife with the legs of flares, with the movements of clockwork and despair. My wife with the hair of a wood fire, with the thoughts of heat lightning, with the waste of an hourglass, with the waste of an otter in the teeth of a tiger. My wife with the breasts of a marine molehill, with the tongue of rubbed amber and glass. No, Salvador Dali, I've decided not to wear your aphrodisiac jacket on my walk to the Hayward Gallery. It's quite a long way, and it would prove too difficult to avoid spilling the creme de menthe in its many little glasses, which I have carefully refilled one by one as per instructions. Anyway, I've no dead flies to float on the surface of each glass, although I've scoured the house for them. Oh, Dali. What a genius you were. What a sad clown you have become. Dali once said, and with justice, the only difference between me and a madman is that I'm not mad. On my walk, I shall bear in mind a directive from André Breton. Expect all good to come from an urge to wander out, ready to meet anything. Marcel Duchamp, painter of nude descending a staircase, descending a staircase. What has always irritated me is that people still insist on thinking of surrealism as an artistic movement. Breton used to call it the artistic alibi. I remember him saying that surrealism is a new vice which should not be the prerogative of just a few men. Magritte used to live in a street not unlike this one. Oh, look, how strange. There's a dog rather like his. I used to go and visit him in Brussels. I often met him taking his dog Lulu for a walk. Always a creature of habit, he invented inside his suburban house a series of profound and disturbing visual jokes. It's difficult to believe he's dead. His spirit is everywhere. Magritte is dead. Long live Magritte. In my youth, I would, on whim, enter a telephone box, dial a number at random, and pass on to the perplexed subscriber a surrealist message. This struck me as a completely legitimate surrealist exercise. Ideal, 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 knowledge, 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 boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom. When Magritte died, the stones fell to the ground, the birds divorced their leaves, the breasts became blind, the tubers extinguished their flames, the pipe remembered its role, the words looked up what they meant in the dictionary, the ham closed its eye forever, when Magritte died. I used to visit Messens, the Belgian leader of the English Surrealists, every Saturday morning towards the end of his life. We often talked about his old friend, Magritte. It's 
extraordinary. I passed here the day before yesterday. It must have happened since. How extraordinary. Messons used to... a fire the day before we do it. Excuse me. When did it, uh, when did it happen, the fire, do you know? Um, I think it was the day before yesterday. Thank Last you. Mm. Well, it's an amazing mess. Amazing. Rather beautiful in a strange way. Funny enough, uh, Edward had several pictures connected with fire. What a mess. It must have gone up like a holocaust up oh. the central. Well, it had an eerie effect on me because I arrived to make a film in what I believed to be a block of flats as I knew it, and suddenly found this charred thing, yeah, this charred yeah. remains. Very tragic to see all these old ladies oh. go out in night shirts. All oh, the freezing cold. Oh. Terrible. The stones are full of guts. Hurrah! Hurrah! When I make a word mean a lot, said Humpty Dumpty, I always pay it extra. Crossing the Thames as a sailor on my way from Chatham, I used to look out at a building which never failed or fails to give me a distinct frisson, a building imbued with a surrealist spirit. It reminded me of the mysterious architecture in the paintings of Giorgio de Chirico. What shall I love if not the enigma? Everything, wrote Chirico, is enigma. The mystery of the building is that the facade is only a shell and that the entire structure is really a pumping station full of elaborate machinery of great rather sinister beauty. Max Ernst's Elephant of Celibes. I thought I saw an elephant who practiced on a fife. I looked again and saw it was a letter from my wife. That Mr. Charles, could you give him a message, please? Could you tell him? An elegant elephant telephones all the time. Thank you. Ah, oh, Dada, the father of surrealism. The movement was named in Zurich in 1917 by opening a dictionary at random. It means something in every language, in French, a child's hobby horse, in English, an infantile sound. Its aims were nihilist. It cried, down with everything. I don't know who painted this graffiti, but I've been sitting on this wall for 10 minutes and nobody has paid any attention to me or it. The Dada bomb, wrote Marcel Jean, was prepared in New York, exploded in Switzerland, set fire to Germany and fizzled out in Paris. And yet the ghost of Dada still rattles its chains. In its time, Dada reacted to everything with a shout of bitter laughter. It rejected everything and mocked everything. It turned its back with contempt on a world beneath contempt. What was Dada? An attempt to clear the ground, to ridicule all those virtues in whose name the First World War had sacrificed a generation. Patriotism, God, the family, grotesque and dishonest masks to hide the faces of nations fighting for commercial and territorial expansion. 
The beginnings of Dada were not art, but disgust. In the Dada Manifesto of 1918, Zara wrote, there's a great negative work of destruction to be accomplished. We must sweep and clean. Kurt Schwitters, the Dadaist from Hanover, chose to make collages of rubbish, things picked up in the street, tram tickets, bottle tops, anything. It was all art for him. He saw no reason to make art with brushes and paint. Everything was art, everything was rubbish. Schwitters, a gentle if extreme spirit, once saved me from disfiguration, perhaps from death. It was in Manchester in 1952. I was walking back to my digs late one night after a gig when I found myself confronted by three young thugs. Some instinct told me to recite a Schwitter's poem. Yes, Dada is everywhere, but who are the heirs of Dada? The punks with their bad taste and determination to offend. Whatever happened to Leon Trotsky? He got an ice pick that made his ears burn. Whatever happened to you lend me the great O'Meara? Long live the Stranglers, but don't let them imagine that they were the first to cry no more heroes. <coughs> Tristan Zara wrote in 1920, no more drunkards, no more aeroplanes, no more enigmas, no more vigor, no more urinary passages. Unfortunately, Zara's abolition of urinary passages doesn't apply in my case. Indeed, it applies less and less with the passing years. The entry to Max Ernst's first exhibition in Cologne was through a public lavatory. Visitors were greeted by a small girl dressed in a white communion dress, reciting obscene poetry. Here the magd die motten putzt, das der wind die dämpfer stutzt. Hierbei wird ein dampf verschluckt, das der kreise bammel stuckt. Dann der warmen Fischerei Knall und Fall ins Einerlei. When the police raided the show, the only exhibit they took away turned out to be an engraving by Albert Dürer. Francis Picabia maintained that the public should be violated in unusual positions. Marcel Duchamp was the first to sign manufactured objects as if they were works of art. This urinal has had the last laugh. It's found its place in a museum. Duchamp originally submitted it to an exhibition committee of which he was a member, failing to disclose that it was his. He'd signed it R. Mutt. From the ready-made to the surrealist object, Man Ray's gift disturbs us precisely because it denies its functions as a flat iron. This is called homage to Isidore Ducasse, the wrappings conceal a sewing machine. Homage to Paganini. 
I can never resist hats. There was an old advertisement which maintained, if you want to get a head, get a hat. And Max Ernst made a collage called The Hats Make the Man. A gold hat for the spring. Do you think everybody will be wearing the gold hats? In the There's Robert Melville kicking a violin along the gutter, like uh, Jack Brunius did in Bunuel's large door. I think I'll leave the gold one for the moment, but... En route to the Hayward, I must stop off at the Barcelona restaurant. It was here, in the 1940s, that the Surrealists used to meet every Monday evening. Nita, how lovely to see you. Nita, short for Incarnita, is the present proprietress. A great improvement on the cross old Spanish Republican who ran it in those days. She would have made a more appropriate Surrealist muse. Thank you very much. Our meetings took place in an upper room. I remember the first time I came here in my sailor suit. I was early. Mr. Mason, he no come yet, said the Spanish Republican. As beautiful as the chance meeting of an umbrella and a sewing machine on the dissecting table. Sir Roland Penrose, the white knight of surrealism, painter, collector, author, friend of Picasso, Ernst Miro. Conroy Maddox, painter and agitator, violator of nuns and surrealist theologian. Eileen Agar, the butterfly with a net. I saw her at the foot of a huge peak smoking with snow. Feyaz Fegar, Turkish surrealist poet. His laugh shatters the minarets and disturbs the Bosphorus. And Robert Melville, art critic, erotic art critic, author of erotic art, but isn't all art erotic, old friend? I cannot truthfully say exactly what was said and done that first evening because I was a bit mad with excitement at being there at all. But I do remember that Messens invited me to read my new poem. To gain access to the regions of convulsive beauty, throw a small coin into the wells of paranoic fur. You are advised to take with you an apple in lieu of your father's heavy sins and an umbrella in case it should rain. Knives and forks! Somewhere in the garden, you will meet the somnambulist butterfly collector. He will show you the right way to the water tower. The Spanish Republican was less enthusiastic. He kicked us out. Over 30 years ago. But the surrealist spirit lives on. Molly Parkin, the wet nurse of solitary pleasures. Her husband, the painter Patrick Hughes, the shepherd of the rainbows. And there's Arthur Moyes, artist by day, anarchist bus conductor by night. At last, the Hayward Gallery, the rendezvous of friends. Beware of the period ahead. Already this world is cracking. Lightning smolders under the bowler hat. Mischief is brewing.